If you're a guest, welcome to our church family. If you're tuning in online, thanks for joining us wherever you may be. Uh, I do have a joke for us today before we jump into God's word. Um, it's short, I promise, um, but it's, it's, it's really funny. It's cute. Um, here's our joke for the day. A Sunday school teacher asked the children just before she dismissed them to go into the main service. And why again is it necessary to be quiet in church? Little Annie replied with a, a shy hand on the back, because people are sleeping. It's pretty fun, right? <laughs> pretty fun, right? <laughs> and 100% accurate. If you're asleep, I will call you out by name today. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Um, well, we <laughs> I have friends who are like, well, he's going to do it anyway. So um, uh, no, we are in week two of our new sermon series called Commission. And we have launched this series in partnership with the commission groups that we are doing that Pastor Andrea encouraged you all to jump into. And we've been focused on the call and the mission, not only of Cucamonga Christian Fellowship, but of the large C church as well. The call to love God, to love people and make disciples. That mission statement is a why. It's why we exist. It's what we're here for. Uh, but what we're trying to do in this series as well is focus on the values and priorities that uphold that missional statement, that uphold that why. And so we're looking at these things of how we accomplish loving God and loving people and making disciples. And we have 12 values or priorities is what we call them that we are going to be looking at, uh, including God's word, God's presence, worship, prayer, relationship, righteousness, unity, honor, evangelism, disciple, multiplication, and generosity. And I said it last week, there will be a quiz um, at the end of service. I hope you got all of those down. Uh, no, but these are the things that uphold what we want to accomplish as followers of Jesus. This is how we express loving God and loving people and making disciples. It's the big rocks in our schedule, if I may. So today we're going to be focused on our first priority, the first way that we try to love God and love others and love uh, and, and make disciples, and, and that's through God's word. And so uh, our first first priority statement is this. God's word is our guide. God's word is our guide. Does anybody out there believe God's word is our guide? Yeah. Amen. Amen. We believe that God's word, the Bible, is living and active. It's God breathed. It's God inspired. It's authoritative. It's useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training up the saint for every work of righteousness in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. God's word gives unerring witness to Jesus. It is truthful and trustworthy in everything that it, it relays about the Lord, about his creation, about his people, about salvation, and about the call to live in faith. And so in all things, we want to be a people who are not only guided by God's word, but who also prioritize God, God's word by revering it and honoring it and teaching it and obeying all of the pieces of scripture. Amen? Amen. So with that stated, we want to focus on God's Word today, so we're going to be in God's Word today. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, why don't you turn open to Luke chapter 4. That's where we're going to be at this morning, Luke chapter 4. Uh, if you want to use the, your Bible app on your phone, Luke chapter 4 verse 17, or 16 is where we're going to be at today. And around here, we like to stand when we read God's Word. So if you're able, let's stand uh, for the reading of God's Word. We, we stand because we want to honor God as we honor His Word. We just said all of these amazing things. We got an amen from you all on those. Uh, we want to honor God, not because um, God is this book, but because this book points to him. Amen. And because this book calls us to action and it offers us movement forward as he breathes and inspires. So this is the reading of God's word today from Luke chapter four, verses 16 through 21. It says this, he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue. This is Jesus, as was his custom. He stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, God, that your word is not, about, is not just about information, it's about transformation. And so today, in Jesus' name, we ask that you would transform us, heart, soul, mind, and strength, God, that we would not leave the same that we came in. We acknowledge, Holy Spirit, that you've already been moving. Thank you for powerful moments and encounters with you in worship and in child dedication and all of the things that we are doing. And now, God, as your word has gone forth, would it land on the fertile soil of our hearts? 
hearts? Would you produce a, a fruit, a harvest, a crop in us 30, 60, even 100 times fold what was originally planted? Today, God, we open ourselves to your move and we say, have your way in every way. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Why don't you grab a seat and as you do, tell your neighbor, God's word is my guide. Guide, not, not my guy. Um, heard of, yeah, that's right, that's right. Well, I have a question for you. Um, how many of you have ever put together Legos before? Any, yeah, that's right. Um, Legos are such a fun toy and they're a great developmental toy for children and adults, amen? Um, there's so much joy in just like throwing a box on the ground and getting on the floor with a kiddo and building towers and spaceships and animals and all of these fun things, right? There's so much creativity to be had, um, but there's also a lot of uh, good fun to be had. And something that's really rewarding is when you get the big sets, like the big boxes, and they come with a guide of, you know, here's how you put it together. And these sets are super fun um, because they're, they're really challenging. Did you know that there are... Um, sets that are 12,000 pieces of Legos to put together. There's a world map that's 12,000 pieces. There's, there's an Eiffel Tower that's uh, 10,001 pieces because 10,000 wasn't enough, right? Um, there's a Titanic that you can build that's 9,090 pieces, right? Now, I think with all of these multi-thousand piece Lego sets, we could get a little bit along the way until we finally just got so frustrated that we just break the thing out of anger or we just put it all back in the box and then take it back to the store, get our refund and then go drown our sorrows in ice cream, amen? <laughs> I thought I was the only one, praise the Lord. <laughs> However, the good news is that these sets come with a step-by-step -step guide. These, these sets come with a step-by-step -step guide. And these step-by-step -step guides are given to the builders to see that there's a big picture, but there is a proven way to put together the pieces in order to make that picture real life. Are you all with me today? Now, I've put together some Legos in my time, mainly for Jason. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but when we moved, we didn't pack our, our Lego sets in the most safe manner. So now there's just uh, trash bags full of Legos that used to be really beautiful. Um, you know, and that's no problem because things break, things fall apart. The only issue is I threw away the guides. So now we just have bags of Legos that are broken and falling apart. And there's nothing to do to put them back together again. Now, here's why I'm bringing up all this Lego talk. Beloved, we have a beautiful picture from the Lord of what it lo looks like to live in full life. We have a beautiful picture from the Lord of what it looks like to live in full life. Loving God, loving people, making disciples. And we can get really creative with these things, but more than anything, we are given a guide right here. We are given a guide to know what to do, to know why to do it, to know how to do it, to know when to do it. And God's word is our guide because it gives us an overview of who God is. It gives us an understanding of what God has done. It gives us an invitation to receive his salvation miracle in our lives. It gives us access to understand that his spirit is moving within us. It gives us directions of what to do and why and how and when. And it gives us opportunities to put all of these things, to be taught and corrected and trained for good works in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. However, we know that the unfortunate reality is that for many people in the church is that maybe they've read one verse or they've done one passage, or maybe they've done one book study. But then when things in life begin to move and things in life begin to fall apart and things in life happen, the guide is thrown away. And other resources are picked up and we think, oh, I could just put it back together by my own strength. Or you know what? Let's just leave it all there and we'll deal with it later. Now stick with me. We just read a story about Jesus coming into Nazareth, as was his custom on the Sabbath, and reading from the scriptures. Jesus is from Nazareth, and he's in this small town in Israel. And during this time, the Roman Empire had overtaken this group of people. And not just overtaken them, but oppressively overtaken them, and forced them to keep certain ordinances that were hard for them to do in accordance with their faith. They're broken. They feel far apart from their Jewish brothers and sisters. It feels like forever to get to people who are in Jerusalem. They're in the midst where they, of a time where it feels like God is silent. They are in the midst of a time where they're not just physically attacked, but spiritually attacked. And in all of this, they're just waiting for a Messiah, a hope of a Messiah to come and restore Israel. 
And you know what Jesus does in the midst of this? He says this, in the midst of seasons of brokenness, in the midst of seasons of waiting and attack and oppression and the many movements of, 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 of our life, God's word should be our response and our guide. He shows us that when enemies and attacks and distractions come in to try to deter us from the mission of God, we have a guide that we have been given to be our anchor, beloved. We have a vision, and if we stay true to this mission, we can do it through his guide as we continually take steps forward with God. Amen? Jesus shows us that there's not only a beautiful picture of loving God and loving people and making disciples, but also allows us to see that we can follow what he did of prioritizing the word in our lives. He does this by showing it through the word, as the word, in the word, and he gives us a model of what it means to lean on God's word as our guide. It's not a one-time owner's manual. It's not a quick study. It's not something that we just read on Sundays. It's not one thing out of the blip of the radar that is our lives. It is God-breathed and inspired and authoritative, and it empowers us to know Jesus more and know who we are and live out the calling he's placed on our lives. Paul put it this way as he was writing to Timothy, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those, those from whom you learned it. And how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Beloved, whether you are, as Paul wrote to Timothy, an infant in this journey with Jesus, or whether you are, as we celebrate grandparents day, a grandparent in this journey with Jesus, our call is the same as it was to Timothy, to keep coming back to these pages. To keep coming back to these pages and letting them refine us and teach us and train us. And as Jesus modeled as well, no matter the season of life, when we come back to these pages, we have an anchor and a firm foundation for our souls. So I want to encourage you to our, our first priority and our main idea today. Let God's word be your guide. Let God's word be your guide. Because when we allow God's word to be our guide, we are better able to respond from it and better able to live as he created us and called us to. When we come to the word of God and allow it to speak to us and inform us and transform us and guide our steps, we're better equipped to walk in truth in the midst of a world of lies. We are better equipped to know love in the, in the midst of a world of hate. We are better equipped to receive God's mercy and extend God's forgiveness and proclaim God's justice in a world that is in desperate need of it. Beloved, as we come to God's word, we will recognize he not only spoke the word, but he is the word. And now he fills us with the spirit of that word as we join in letting it guide us. Amen. In this life, we're going to experience movement. Things are going to fall apart. Things are going to break. Things will happen as we are not expecting them to, but we have a guide of how it looks to put things back together in a beautiful life founded in Christ Jesus. And so because we have this, we want to prioritize God's word as our guide. And I want to give you a few steps this morning from Luke chapter four. Is everybody still with me? Amen. The first point is coming from the, the first few verses of what happened in this passage. Jesus went to the synagogue in Nazareth, as we read it, right? It's the Sabbath, it's his custom, and he goes forward, and, it, and the scriptures tell us he got up to read the scriptures. Now, the Greek of this, uh, I looked it up this week, it's implying this, Jesus went to church and he read the Bible. That's a joke, y'all, come on. I worked all week on that one, and I... <laughs> No, I didn't. No, joking aside, the reality is this. We can't be led by something that we haven't opened up. We cannot say that God's word is a lamp for our feet when we're still choosing other dim lights in the darkness of this world. We cannot say that we're guided by God's word if we are not opening the pages of scripture and looking over the map of his story and his calling and his commission and his commandments and his promises. So our first step is very clear here. If we want God's word to be our guide, we've got to read it. We've got to read the scriptures. Now listen, we live in a culture in which other mediums of technological advancement have overtaken reading. We live in a fast-paced culture, video, audio, AI, other creative technological developments. Now I'm not saying these things are bad in and of themselves. I'm just saying we've lost the art of reading. 
We've lost the art of reading. Just think back to 2020 when you and I were experts on the pandemic or masking or ethnicity or politics or religion simply because we watched a 30 second video on YouTube or TikTok. That's how it was, friends. We didn't read, we didn't tune into things. And beloved, it's a symptom of the larger plague that is happening in our culture. But the reality is that our Savior demonstrated the power of what it means to read the scriptures. Individually, in community, we are called to read the word of God. Amen? From Old Testament to New, this is what happened. As Joshua takes leadership of the people of Israel, this is the first command that the Lord gives him in Joshua 1, verse 8. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. It's the first thing that Joshua is commanded to do as he's leading the people of God in the promised land. This is the same that continues in the book of Acts. Thousands of people come and they give their lives to Jesus. They're baptized. They form into the church. And we're told this, Acts 2.42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. The apostles' teaching is this. Here's how all of the scriptures are fulfilled in what Jesus has done. They taught the word of God every single day. They got in the word of God and read it and listened and let it form them every single day. All throughout the word, we see this understanding. There's a calling to and a practice of and a growth from reading the scriptures. But how many of you know that there are so many things in our life that get in the way of us reading the word? Right? I was reminded of that when I, we were woken up at 4 a.m. this morning <laughs> by our baby boy. and <laughs> That's the best distraction there is. <laughs> But we find ourselves in the midst of life, distractions, temptations, other forms of entertainment, attacks on our life. They all want to take us away from being with the Lord and being in his word. And the more we give ourselves over to those things, the more they will become our response rather than the word of God being our guide. A.W. Tozer said it like this, whatever keeps me from my Bible is my enemy. However harmless it may appear, whatever engages my attention when I should be meditating on God and things eternal does injury to my soul. Let the cares of life crowd out the scriptures from my mind and I have suffered loss where I can least afford it. Let me accept anything else instead of the scriptures and I have been cheated and robbed to my eternal confusion. Beloved, this isn't to say that all we should be doing in our lives is reading the Bible, but it is to say we should be prioritizing reading the Bible more than anything else in our life. Why? Because when the other things of life happen, we have a perspective to see them through. When the news cycles start to report up, we have a lens now to look through them at. When things happen in our lives that we go, I don't know the definition for that, we have something to define it with. When there's a a fork in the road and we don't know which way to go, we have directions. Beloved, when we prioritize the word of God in our lives, everything else in our life will be impacted by it. And here's the thing, without reading the word of God, we don't know what's actually in it. I know that was a big sentence. (laughs) If we don't read it, we don't know what's in it. And beloved, there are far too many people preaching things today that are not in the word of God. And there are far too many people that have experienced church hurt because people are preaching things that are not in the word of God. And it's damaging and it's divisive and it's leading people astray. But when we can come and center our lives around the God-breathed, inspired, authoritative words of Christ, we will discover this is the true story of God. This is the true invitation of salvation. This is the promise and security of eternity. And sometimes when we read the word of God, I'll just be honest with you. When we read the word of God, we walk away and we go, that was the most refreshing thing I've ever done in my life. And other times we walk away and we go, I'm still in Leviticus. (laughs) And either way, the blessing of it is this. We're prioritizing our time in the story of Jesus. We're prioritizing and centering our lives around the scriptures and we're opening ourselves to the Lord through his word. This might be the easiest way that we can love God is by simply spending time with him in his word. The people of God modeled this in Old and New Testament. Jesus modeled this. And I could tell you every day, I try to spend multiple moments in God's word. And there's nothing better to read. There's nothing more entertaining. There's no better story. There's no better way to spend our spare time, beloved. But as you know, reading takes time and we've got to prioritize it. We can't rush it. We can't brush past it. It calls for us to take time for the sake of spending time with the Lord and loving him as we read his word. Amen. 
So I want to give you some action steps here. Just four simple action steps and you'll see them on your sermon notes as well. Step number one, take time in the morning and evening to read God's word. Take time in the morning and evening to read God's word. Some of you read it morning, some of you read it evening. Hallelujah for both. Read it both. There is no better way to start or end your day. I promise you. You want to know why you keep scrolling on social media before you go to sleep? Because it's not good. You keep looking for something that's good in there, but you're never going to find it. Take time in the morning and evening to read God's word. Amen? Amen. Secondly, there's nothing wrong with opening up and kind of doing the Bible roulette of going, all right, Jesus, point me to where it is. Right? There's nothing wrong with it. But I will say this. There's nothing wrong as well with serving a God who's a God of order. Choose a plan. Step number two is choose a plan. Make a plan for your reading. We make plans for other things in life and it turns out pretty good, right? It turns out pretty good when we prioritize it. Choose a plan, maybe including Old Testament and New Testament in your readings. There are Bible plans all out there. Bible Gateway on the U version of the Bible app, Reeb's Scripture Bible app. There are Bible, plan, Bible reading plans everywhere. Step number three, pray. Pray while you read, pray before you read, pray after you read, pray for what you read to take root in your heart. And step number four is repeat it all. Repeat it all. Just let this happen every single day. And you know what? If you don't have a Bible in this room, we have Bibles out for you at the info desk. Stop at the info desk after service. We would love to get a written copy of God's word into your hands so that you could be in it every day. Amen? Amen. Beloved, our first step is simple. We've got to read God's word if we want it to guide us. We can't lead somebody to where we haven't been. And if God, if we allow God by his word to guide us, then we can stand on firm foundation and bring others along with us. Amen? The second way you can allow God's word to be your guide is by practicing our second point. We need to read, but we also need to research. We need to research. Read, then research. So Jesus is in the synagogue. He's in Nazareth, right? He gets up to read the scriptures. Attendant, uh, the scribe gives him the scroll. He goes to Isaiah 58 and Isaiah 61, and he reads this beautiful passage, right? The spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news puts it back in the hands of the scribe, goes and sits down and then tells everybody, listen, this scripture today is fulfilled in your hearing. So for many people in the synagogue, they thought Jesus was telling them, I'm the Messiah who has come to restore Israel. And he was, but they were only thinking of it because they had read the scriptures in a certain way before, but he was giving them a better interpretation. Are you all with me? They had read the scriptures in a certain way and they're thinking, we're oppressed by the, the Greek empire, we're impressed by the Ro oppressed by the Roman empire, and now we're waiting for the Messiah to come and overcome these empires and be the promised one that would restore all of the Jewish people back into power. And you know what? Maybe we'd camp in that same area if we read it the same way they did. And in all honesty, maybe some of the church is doing that today, still. And what Jesus was doing, though, was he was speaking through reading these scriptures and saying, it's fulfilled in me. And he's inviting these people in this synagogue to understand something. It's not by your reading of the scriptures, it's by their fulfillment in Christ Jesus. It's not just by reading, it's by Christ's fulfillment, how they're understood in Jesus, how they're actualized in Jesus, how they're fulfilled, and then call us forward. Did you know that interestingly in Luke chapter 24, he meets those two guys on the road, Cleopas and his buddy, and they're mourning. And Jesus says, what are you guys talking about? And they say, we're talking about Jesus, a prophet, mighty in word and deed, and he's dead and gone, but we thought he would be the one to restore Israel. They thought he would be the same thing. Acts chapter one, the disciples are given the spirit of God and told to go and proclaim the word to all of the world. And then they look at Jesus and go, so are you going to restore Israel now? <laughs> they were reading through their own lenses and hoping for a Messiah to come with military strength and overcome the oppressors in their lives. And do you know what happened? Jesus did overcome the oppressors in their lives. He came as a baby and he laid down his life humbly in a manner of service and he still overcame the oppressors of sin, hell, and the grave. Beloved, he did it by welcoming the foreigner and the stranger and the outcast and the overlooked. He did it by a completely different approach and showed and invited to all those reading. It's not by your reading, it's by his fulfillment of it. If we want God's word to be our guide, we have got to take our lenses off and put on the lens of Jesus. 
We have got to research his word. We need to examine the scriptures, history, context, authors, original intent, letters, book stories, all of it. We've got to dive deeper into the scriptures. And here's the promise. When you dive deeper into the scriptures, they dive deeper into you. They dive deeper into you and they not only inform, but they transform everything about your life. This is what happened in Acts 17 when, the, when a group of Berean Jews are hearing Paul's message of Christ's death and resurrection. We're told this, the Berean Jews were, more of, were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica for they received the message with great eagerness and they did what? Examine the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. Beloved, when we examine the scriptures and make sure the message about Jesus is true in our lives, it ends up being so important for us because it leads to our understanding and our witness. You see what happened in that passage? Many of those Jews believed, and not only Jews, but Greeks. Not only men, but women. It leads to the beautiful, diverse, unified kingdom of God coming together through the proclamation of the gospel. If we don't know where to go, we can't lead people there. If we don't know how to read a map and we tell people directions, we're all lost, right? The more we can search God's word and research God's word, we can allow that to fill our understanding with his guiding principles and lead us to be who he's called us to be and do what he's called us to do, amen? There's a movie that came out in 1993 called The Nightmare Before Christmas. Anybody seen that by a show of hands? Fantastic movie. Disneyland's about to get all um, Nightmare Before Christmas right now. Um, it's, a, it's a super fun movie. So the main character is that guy, Jack Skellington, and he's from Halloween Town. And Halloween Town does what you think they would do. They do Halloween big and great every year. Pulling pranks, super scary, all of those things. They pull off a Halloween and then Jack is super frustrated. He's super unhappy. So he starts go, going and searching around in the movie and he stumbles upon what's called Christmas Town. And he falls in love. There's snow, there's lights, there's Santa Claus, there's reindeer, there's presents, there's snowmen. What is all of this is what he's saying, right? So he's got this great idea. Let's go back to Halloween Town and let's do Christmas next year. So the whole movie is about how Halloween Town is trying to do Christmas. Here's the issue though, is they want to make everything scary and explosive and poisonous and have snakes and zombies and all of those things, right? So by the end of the movie, spoiler alert, Jack is Sandy Claus and he's on his sleigh with skeleton reindeer throwing down presents that are pumpkin bombs that are filled with snakes and there's fire, people are running for their lives, there is damage and destruction everywhere. Here's why I bring this up. They tried to do Christmas through the lens of Halloween and what it led to was division, destruction, and death. Is everybody with me right now? In the same way, when we bring our American lenses to try to read a book that was written in a vastly different culture and that's how we interpret it, it will lead to division, destruction, and death. Beloved, there is one lens and his name is Jesus and all of the word finds its place in him. So I want to give you an action step. We must read the scriptures and we must research the scriptures. Did you know that there are more books written about the Bible than any other book in the world? Yeah. That means that there are a lot of really incredibly smart people who've spent their entire lives going through these pages and researching them and then putting forth information for you and I to come forward to and say, I don't know what this is. Let's see what other people had to say about it. Beloved, there are so many helpful resources. BibleGateway.com has free commentaries that you wouldn't imagine. There's a beautiful resource called The Bible Project that does book overviews for every book in the Bible. YouTube videos of every book in the Bible, articles, number of other helpful resources. There are hundreds upon thousands of resources written to help you dive deeper into this book. And here's the reality, beloved. They will help us put on a better lens of not just being informed, but transformed as we look through the lens of Jesus and how it finds its fulfillment in him. Amen? Amen. I want to give you a third way that we can let God's word be our guide. We need to read it. We need to research it. We need to receive it. We need to receive it. In Luke 4, when uh, Jesus goes to the synagogue, he relays this information, reads from the scroll of Isaiah, says, this is fulfilled in your hearing. And he says, I am the Messiah. I am this one who's been prophesied. And in doing this, he's inviting them not only through reading and researching, but through receiving it. He's saying, listen, I'm here in the flesh. It's one thing to know about somebody. It's another thing to know somebody, Right? It's one thing to read and research and have head knowledge. It's another thing to believe it and receive it and do something about it. 
Let me put it this way. How many of you believe John 3.16 is universally true? By a show of hands. Anybody out there? God so loved the world, he gave his only son. Whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal, everlasting life. Amen? Amen. I could be on a stage in Kenya, that would be true. I could be on a platform in India, that would be true. Everywhere in this world, that is true. Amen? Amen? Now let me ask you a question. When did it become your truth? When did it become your truth? When you received it for yourself. It doesn't make a difference. It still was universally true, but it became your truth when you received it and embraced it and believed upon it. Amen? We must be a people who read and research and then receive it. More than anything, we've got to let God's word read us. We've got to let God's word read us and not just stop at our heads, but into our hearts and transform everything about us because his words are God breathed and inspired and authoritative and they guide us. And as we open, that's what we start breathing and inspiring and moving in power as we are who we have been called to be and doing what God has called us to do. Amen. Now, the hard thing about this is that in this passage, the Jewish people are hearing this and thinking, wow, again, this is the Messiah. He's come to restore Israel. He's here. We're good to go. It's going to be a benefit for us. But what he actually was showing to them was it wasn't just for the Jews, but for all people. Amen? That's good news for you and I sitting in this room that don't have Hebrew heritage. When he says the spirit of the Lord God is upon me to preach good news to the poor, to open blind eyes, to set the captive and oppressed free, to proclaim the year of Jubilee, that's not just for the Jews, it's for all. But the Jewish people thought, yeah, we'll receive that if it's a blessing for us. You don't want to help the people that are oppressing us, do you? You don't want to, you don't want to help the people that are hurting us, do you? You don't want to help the people that think different or vote different or look different or speak different, do you? But what he was inviting them into is allowing the word to read them and transform them so that they would be blessed to be a blessing. Beloved, the entirety of Scripture is a story about God bringing blessing on His people and through His people. It's about us being a part of the family of God and saying, hey, are you a part of this family? Not yet. There's an invitation for you. And when I receive the Word of God, it changes something about me so that every other person, I look at them and say, I want them to be a part of this family. The reality is that God's word is living and active, beloved. And as we embrace this with our actions and receive this blessing and portray it to the world, it's not just about actions, it's about our words as well. There's a calling not just to know about them, but to know them and be transformed, right? Jesus shows this in Luke 4, but this is also his entire life. The gospel of John says this, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. Amen. We know that Jesus is the word. We know that Jesus is God. We know that through his word, all things were created and sustained and hold together and they find their life and their purpose. The reality is that Jesus is not some far off God that created and left us to our own being. He's not some Greek myth who needs us either. He is the word. And the word has come in flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. And even though he's gone to heaven, he said, I'm leaving a better advocate with you. We are filled with the very presence of God if we call in the name of Jesus for salvation. And by his blood, we are washed. And by his word, we are washed. And we are made now, transformed now to be in his image and likeness and to proclaim this benefit, not just for ourselves, but for everybody around us. This is the good news, right? So we need to be a people who receive. We need to be a people who receive. So I want to give you an action step. There's this idea of what's called spiritual reading. This is your action step. Spiritual reading is a a term that was coined by Henry Nouwen is this idea of reading the word of God and asking for the word of God to transform us. Henry Nouwen writes about it like this. Spiritual reading is food for our souls. You want to talk about soul food? As we slowly let the words of the Bible or any spiritual book enter into our minds and descend into our hearts, we become different people. The word gradually becomes flesh in us and thus transforms our whole beings. The purpose of spiritual reading is not to master knowledge or information, but to let God's spirit master us. Strange as it may sound, spiritual reading means to let ourselves be read by God. Spiritual reading is reading with an inner attentiveness of the movement of God's spirit in our outer and inner lives. With that attentiveness, we will allow God to read us and to explain to us what we are truly about. Beloved, the word is not just words. 
His name is Jesus. And he's taken on flesh and he's inviting you to do the same. It's time now, not to just read the word, but to let the word read us and inform us and transform us as we open ourselves to be guided and led by his word. Amen? Amen. Can I give one final point this morning? We need to read, we need to research, we need to receive, and the fourth one is we need to respond. We need to respond. Listen, it would be one thing if Jesus were to put down this, pick up this scroll, say all this beautiful things about what he's going to do, hand it back to the scribe, and then people say, hey, are you going to do anything about that? And he just sits in the synagogue all day. It'd be one thing for Jesus to say, I'm going to do all these amazing things, but then do nothing about it. The reality, though, is that Jesus, as the word of God, read the word of God, gave a deeper understanding, researched it, gave opportunity to be received, and then he responded with his whole life. He responded. There's not one point in the Gospels or all of Scripture that you'll find where Jesus gives an instruction and then tells the disciples to be inactive. There's not one point. Waiting is an action, by the way. Abiding is an action, by the way. The whole movement of Christianity is an active grace of God that transforms us and empowers us and propels us forward with a mission, beloved. Nowhere in the word of God will you find a call to be stagnant. And it's not to earn our salvation, it's to live from it and in it. And here's why this is important, because there are far too many people in the church and in the world who are bobbleheads. It's all filled up here, but they're stationary. It's all knowledge up here. I know what the references are. I know the Old Testament stories. I know who scholars think wrote Job. I know these things, but are you doing anything about it? Do your feet get moving? Do your hands get serving? Does your heart move with compassion like his did? Beloved, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. The reality is that we know from God's word that when we put his word into action in our lives, it leads to loving him and loving people and making disciples. When we put his word into actions, it gives us a firm foundation and a response in the midst of attack and a way forward when it seems like we're stuck, right? The action of God's word propels us to know God and know ourselves. James wrote it this way, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. This book, these scriptures are a mirror, beloved. When you have forgotten what you look like, it might be because we've heard these words and are not putting them into practice. Beloved, this is a mirror so that we can look more like Jesus as he transforms us. And here's what happens when we do these words. We are blessed. It is a blessing. And we're not called to simply read them or hear them, but to do them. We're called to allow them to read us and then respond with our lives. Not just to know, I know God has called me to do this, but to actually do it. Not just to say, oh, I know God has called me to be this, but to actually be it. And here's the reality. When we do it and and are that, we are blessed to be a blessing. But I can't tell you that we're just called to respond with actions, but with our words as well, right? Jesus, in Matthew chapter 4, is led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the enemy. 40 days, 40 nights, he's fasting and praying. And the enemy comes forward three times and tempts him and twists God's word and tries to give him false pretenses of power. And each time, do you know what Jesus' response is? The word of God. The word of God. Every single time he responds and he corrects the lies with the truth. He corrects the false power with real power. He stands his ground in the fullness of God's promise. He shows us that in the midst of our lives, when we feel hungry and thirsty in the wilderness, attacked, oppressed, like words have come against us, that there is a firm foundation to stand upon. There is a truth that will set us free and a a hope for our soul, a faith that will be ignited, a compassion for our heart, a kingdom that wants to equip us for more than what we were doing before we had first heard that word, there is a gift that is given through God's word, beloved. And it should be our response in the midst of the wilderness seasons, in the midst of waiting, in the midst of brokenness, in the midst of facing lies and temptations and false promises and attacks from the enemy. Our call is to allow God's word to be our guide and to respond with our whole being. With our whole being, beloved. 
The word of God is full of action steps. Love one another, humbly serve one another, forgive, visit those who are sick and in prison, feed, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, speak the truth in love, put off slander, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, right? All throughout the word of God, there are action steps. So I wanna give you one action step you can do this week. It's a simple question as you do your reading. Ask the Lord this, according to your word, what is one thing I can do today to love you, to love others, and to make disciples? A simple, straightforward question. You don't need to solve all of world hunger, but maybe you can give a person a sandwich because that's what the Lord called you to do. You don't need to heal every broken relationship, but maybe you need to sit with somebody who's hurting. A simple, straightforward response in the midst of the world's pain is for us to come and just say, Lord, what are you calling me to do according to your word? as a simple step of loving you and loving others and making disciples. I believe as we do, we will be better prepared in the midst of our wilderness seasons to respond from God's word. Amen? Amen. I'm gonna invite the worship team up and I'll invite you to stand to your feet as well. Beloved, we have a guide that has been given to us. A guide through God's word. It's alive, it's active, it's God breathed, it's God inspired, it's authoritative for our lives. It invites us into salvation. It shows us a story in which our story is brought into. It trains us for righteousness. It equips us for good works. When your life falls apart, when you feel like there's no way up or down, when you don't know how to piece things back together again, God has given us a glorious picture through his mission. He's given us a step-by-step -step guide that even in the midst of the wilderness, even in the midst of attacks, even in the midst of oppression, even in the midst of the questions, there is certainty that we have because these words are a firm foundation. And they lead us into the eternal relationship that we can receive in Christ Jesus. The Lord is true to his word, amen? His word does not go forward and come back void, amen? Amen. His word finishes what it starts. He will lead us forward as we allow it to transform us and guide us. And we will become blessed to be a blessing. His word is our guide. And I look forward. I look forward in Jesus' name to hear all of the beautiful things that are going to happen in your lives and in our community as we allow this word to be a lamp to our feet and a guide to our life. Amen. So in just a moment, the team is gonna respond in worship and I, it's just a simple song of singing out Jesus' name. The word is not just words, beloved. His name is Jesus. There's an opportunity this morning for us to respond with not just actions, but our words, and not just words, but our actions and our whole lives. As we respond in worship, we are lifting high the one who has called himself the word of God, the one who is peace and life, the one who gives us hope and assurance, the one who is our guide, amen? So I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna respond in a time of worship this morning. Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you, Jesus, that you are the word of God. That in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Thank you that you didn't stay in this too far concept. You came close, God. You took on flesh you took what we couldn't. Thank you, Jesus, for the gospel reality that you've overcome those things of sin and oppression and the grave and hell and the enemy. And you have given us a firm foundation to stand upon through your finished work, through the word of God. Thank you, Jesus, that in the midst of our lives, you have given us a way forward. Lord, we recognize that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. In the midst of the darkness of our lives, would you illuminate us by your word? Would you form us and shape us, inform and transform, Lord? Send us out, God, as we read and research and receive and respond. Let us be a people who embody these words and reveal the truth that sets free to this world, God. Jesus, thank you that you are the word. We fix our eyes upon you. We declare our love for you. We say yes to you today. We respond with hearts of worship in Jesus' name.